Hello, welcome to Speech Talk Live. This is episode number 46. My name is Jay Oza. I'm the host of the show, and uh, my co host is uh, Julie Wu Finkelstein. I want to thank you for watching the show, or if you're joining live, thank you. Uh, Julie and I are both mentors for the Coursera course, uh, Introduction to Public Speaking. We've been doing that now for, I think, more than a year, probably closer to two years now. And we use this show as a way to uh, educate, well, several things. We like to learn. So we're a student uh, in heart. So we like to learn, we like to teach, we like to coach, and we also like to get better at uh, public speaking or speaking in general. So that's why we do this show. It's uh, our way of learning, but also to help others since uh, it's a global community and it's not possible to help individually since you know we're both uh, volunteers. So today's show, we have three segments. That's uh, pretty much uh, our normal show. In uh, segment one, I'll it'll be a discussion topic around ask. I think one of the things that I think a lot of speakers don't think about this, and something I wanted to discuss with Julie, is that you need to know what your ask is before you even give a speech. Because if you just give a speech without knowing what your ask is, then the question is you're leaving the audience kind of confused, like what should they do? So I think the ask is something that's kind of important you have to think about. Uh, and we'll, we'll have a discussion on that. The second segment is our continuation series. Uh, Julie has been uh, kindly recording these videos. Uh, and she's trying something different now. She's split these uh, videos into two now. One is uh, a, a talk video about the pose that she then demos after she does a video on the talk. So rather than doing it in one video, I think it works out better by having it separated into two videos. So Julie will facilitate that segment. And uh, this time, she has done a video on a pigeon pose. So she will uh, uh, discuss the talk part and also the demo part. And then if I, I will give her feedback based on what kind of feedback she's looking for. That's typically our format. And it's also a good way for you to understand how to do these type of uh, show and tell videos. And then the third segment is uh, uh, something that I came up uh, when I was listening to this podcast. I think something that I mentioned it in the past, uh, uh, it's a Michael Port's uh, podcast that he does with Seth Godin. And they were having this discussion around high stakes. And I wanted to discuss that. Like, you know, we're all in a high stake situation when we're speaking, but how do you be yourself and still be able to handle that high stake situation? So we'll have a discussion topic on that. And uh, before I turn it over to Julie, I'm just going to use my 90 seconds uh, to talk about something that I uh, observed uh, last night. Uh, uh, in the United States last night, they had our the primary election, and on the Republican side, uh, Donald Trump uh, did really well. He won five uh, of the states where they had the primaries. But the thing that was interesting was uh, when he came to give a speech, I noticed something kind of interesting. He had all kinds of audio problems. And that occurred to me that here's the guy who's running for president, and he did not take care of this detail. I mean, his whole brand is around taking care of details. That's his brand. He take That's... That's what he is. That's how he's become rich, you know. But how could you miss something so simple as not work, taking care of the audio? I mean, this is at his site. This is not at a some uh, remote site or something that he has no control over. Even if he had that, he knew that he was going to do well. He knew he was going to give a speech. He knew he was going to ask questions. Why not make sure that the audio is the last thing that you have to worry about that not working well? And it also goes to show that when you're giving a speech, make sure your audio is working <laughs> before you actually give a speech. Because if the audio is not working, it not only reflects poorly on the people who are in charge of the audio, they'll never see them, but it reflects poorly on you. Then why didn't you take care of it? So I just learned an important lesson from watching uh, Donald Trump that no matter how big you are, if you don't take care of these details, it comes back on you. So. Whenever you have an opportunity to give a speech, take care of the audio. Uh, Julie, why don't you, I'll pass it over to you. Why don't you introduce yourself and see if you have any 90 second insight for us to uh, think about. 
Thanks, Jay. So God is in the details. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Julie Wu Finkelstein, and I like to put the wood in there because otherwise someone thinks I'm seven feet tall German woman. <clears throat> and I'm a five feet three Chinese woman. So um, I participate with Jay in many uh, public speaking technique uh, projects. And um, one of them that I love is this one, and the other one uh, we uh, mentor the Coursera course, and finally we're supporting each other doing books. Today, um, I want to talk about using videos to play with finding your identity. I have um, two people I coach, and they coach me on different things, and I've asked them to do um, a five-minute video on something about themselves or their core message because one of them is a musician and they want he wants to be interviewed on TV and radio talk shows and yet um, his uh, handler doesn't really work with him on how to present himself. June is coming up and he's supposed to go on TV shows in June so I'm making him to do videos. Um, the other person is, uh, I will call a, a pathfinder supporter for those people who are interested in using uh, emerging technologies with holistic health, bridging ancient and leading edge technologies for health. So look at things like Ayurvedic, holistic, um, DNA, patterning, lifestyle choices, etc. And I'm, uh, she wants me to help her with a mission statement, so I'm asking her to do a five-minute video uh, on it, and she wants a tagline, so I'm going to work with her after she does the video. So taking the advice that Jay gave me, which is don't help people until they help themselves, they're going to have to step up with their games. And I'm inviting you all to talk about yourself on the video. There's a great software called ClipChamp, five minutes are its limit, and you can talk anything for five minutes, and then you can share with someone. Find a practice buddy. Jay has given me um, innumerable good advice, so I just want to share that five-minute talk about yourself to help your identity and your mission. Do it now or do it today, and if you want someone to email to, you can email it to me. Best of luck and thank you. <clears throat> Excellent suggestion, uh, Julie. Uh, I will uh, include your email, so if anybody is uh, interested uh, taking Julie's offer, I will include her email and you can uh, send it to her. Uh, what is the name of the, the software? Clip Chat? Clip Champ, my champion. Clip. C L I P C H A M. P. Okay, and it's uh, it's freely available, or you have to it's pay for it. It's freely available, and you can share that right away on YouTube, Facebook, and a few other um, social medias right yeah, away. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, it might be useful if you can record a video on how you're using this clip champ. Uh, I know it probably is intuitive, but just so sort of, there are a lot of people out there when you mention new technology, they get scared. So uh, one of the action item I have for you is uh, record a short video on what exactly do you do, uh, give the people all the details on how to use it, and then show a finished product uh, of a video. You can even say this video, I'm using ClipChamp, and here's what I did. So that way people can then, because one of the things is you want to, sometimes the technology can also act as an impediment. So if you can show them how easy it is, uh, then people will start doing it. Uh, the other thing uh, I'll mention to you, I know you said you're coaching somebody who's going to be doing uh, interviews uh, after you've coached that person if that you can also offer to that person to since i don't know who that person is uh, that uh, if they want to do a mock interview on the show and they can then we can do a mock interview it'll give that person a practice and then they can the person can watch it on youtube how well he or she did so offer that to the person if uh, that person is interested in doing that, because I think it would be a good practice. I mean, obviously you're coaching them, but at some point they they need a some sort of a, a, like a role play where they can actually see themselves, how they look and how they appear and answering questions. So that's good stuff, Julie. Thanks a lot. And we'll take a brief pause and move to our first segment. 
Okay, welcome back uh, to Speech Talk Live, uh, episode number 46. My name is Jay Oza. I'm the host, and my co-host is uh, Julie Wu Finkelstein. And as we have said before, we're both mentors uh, for the Coursera course, uh, Introduction to Public Speaking. Uh, in this uh, first segment, uh, which is going to be a discussion uh, on a topic uh, that I recorded a video. And uh, the video that I recorded had to do with uh, uh, that when you're giving a speech, you need to have, you got to know your ask. Like, what exactly are you asking? And it's not just simple enough that you just give a speech and then you're done. That doesn't do anything. A lot of times people, because let's face it, uh, people are scared when they're giving a speech. And they're just happy to be done with and sit down or disappear. But uh, the thing that you do need to think about, and this is something you got to think about before you give the speech, the first thing you have to do is, what exactly are you asking the audience to do? It could be something simple as, hey, if you want more details, you can get, like Julie does that really well. Uh, and I, I can we can talk about that in her video. Maybe uh, she can uh, improve the ask a little bit. But uh, come up with the ask and ask somebody to just review your ask. Are you asking something that is doable and how they can do it? Whether it could be, uh, like in my case, uh, I, I use the video that, uh, <clears throat> in my video I said I coach people win with their speeches. And I said, I can help, perhaps I can help you too do the same or something like that. And that was just an intro speech, but I just, included even an ask in there because if you're not asking then the audience of whoever you're talking to is just listening but there is nothing for that person to do and you need that person to interact with you engage with you and the ask allows you to do that so anytime you you are working on your intro speech or an impromptu speech or informative or persuasive I think it's important to really start and put down big word ask what am i asking the audience to do what what do i want the audience to do what is my ask and i think that way <clears throat> you at least have a focus that after the speech it's not one and done <clears throat> it's a continuation it could <clears throat> lead to a relationship it could lead to a business it could lead to a thought leadership but there has to be an ask there something you're asking uh, your audience members uh, to do. So, uh, Julie, w <clears throat> since you're doing these videos uh, on uh, uh, these poses, uh, the, the hack, the integral hack, what do you think of that? What What are you asking your audience? I, you, you don't need to answer this because we're going to cover that in the next uh, video, but it is something that, uh, uh, do, do you give any thought to that before you record your videos? Thanks, Jay. I just took a minute to take a deep breath. I, I really like the word that you put clear to ask. Yes, I uh, I have been asking, and I think uh, with your help, I'd be much more proactive about asking. But I really like the word clear because I think uh, uh, sometimes I ask, but I don't make sure is that I'm clearly asking. And I... Um, I liked your speech a lot, and I thought that um, your use of the example of the pen handler was very profound and poignant. Uh, in the sense that it was poignant was because, you know, um, to many of us have a deep fear of being exactly where they're at, right? It's an existential fear. So to connect to that deep emotional level is poignant, and to um, for your generosity to say to admit to your to the audience you don't usually do it, but you felt compelled to do it this time, that made it personal. It helped me make a connection with you. The reason why I thought it was also profound was uh, at the end, and I would have liked you to elaborate that a little bit more personally for me, and not giving you guidelines, I'm just giving you my personal feedback, is that you said something, you said the pen handler was very good at asking for something small, and maybe if he could have asked for something bigger, he'd become a great salesman. 
And what that resonated for me personally is some of us are afraid to ask for something big. And so maybe um, at the end you were, I infer from what I think you were implying is don't be afraid to ask for something big. Because at one point you even talked about five million dollars. And I would like that part of your ask of the audience to be more clear. Is that don't be, you know, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask for what you really want, and don't be afraid to ask for something big. Like that's like one, two, three. I've been working with someone that I want her to start saying one, two, three. Maybe not out loud, but in in her mind, because what your point of sixty, thirty, ten. But one, two, three. I, I would have liked to hear that actually a bit more clearly. So that's my. Um, I really want to applaud you for making this like the foreground of the talk because it helps me to focus on what is important that I might not be looking at. So thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, Julie, thanks a lot for that feedback. Uh, yeah, I that example of $5 million was, uh, I took it from uh, this book, Donald Trump's book, Donald Trump's book, uh, the, the Art of the Deal where Jimmy Carter had come to him after he had lost the election to contribute $5 million to the, uh, the Jimmy Carter Library. And uh, I think <clears throat> the first thing to do is, uh, and I mean, this is a deep topic. I didn't want to make it too long <laughs> to, <laughs> because the main thing is I just wanted to get it out there. But I think now what you're saying is that there is much more here, that this could be expanded into a much longer speech because there's a lot of things in here that uh, what I can do is I can write a blog and then we can see if I can turn that into a, uh, uh, an informative or persuasive speech. But uh, the, the, thing, the thing to do is first, like, like, you know, we do a lot of role playing as far as here's our message, here's this, here's that. All that thing is fine. But at some point you have to kind of move the ball, if I may use that metaphor. And to move the ball, there has to be an ask. Otherwise, you don't move the ball. Like, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, when I grew up in India, there were all these uh, uh, cows, and they're pretty stubborn. They don't move. you got to goad them, you know, otherwise they just sit there. They're, like, lazy. They don't want to move. And human beings are no different. you got to, like, poke them, like, move, move, move. And ask is like that poke. you got to poke them, like, you know, hey, like little kids, little kids figure that out very quickly. But then as they get older, they forget to ask because now they think like, oh, I can do it myself. Why do I need to ask? So I think we just we just need to keep that in mind when we are giving a speech. You know, what is it that we're asking? Because remember, speech, when I'm talking about a speech, I'm not just talking about being on the stage. I think for that, you should have it. Let's assume that most people will have that. But there are a lot of asks that we don't ever take advantage of in an informal uh, setting, where whether it's networking, whether it's, now again, there is an art of asking, you know, you just don't go and say, hey, can you give me a million dollars like that? Uh, there has to be something that you can help that person with that allows you to ask. So I think there's a lot involved here. That's why I didn't want to go too deep into it. I just wanted to kind of throw it out there saying that at least uh, think about it when you're working on your speech, whether it's intro, impromptu, informative or persuasive. So thanks for that feedback. And any closing thoughts on, on this topic before uh, we move on to segment two? I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was uh, unmuted. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea. And anytime I can support you, let me know. Thank you. OK, great. Thanks a lot, Julie. And at this point, uh, we'll uh, end this. Uh, we'll take a brief pause and move on to our next segment. <clears throat> okay, welcome back to Speech Talk Live, episode 46, and uh, this is segment number two. I, my name is Jay Oza. I'm the host, and my co-host is Julie Vu Finkelstein. And in this uh, uh, segment, second segment of this uh, Speech Talk Live, uh, we're going to discuss uh, the, the video uh, that uh, Julie has been working on. It's a series of videos that Julie has been working on. And one of the things that Julie's trying to do is uh, educate uh, people on these uh, simple poses or stretches so that you can kind of, uh, uh, you know, gain strength, uh, uh, 
gain stability and even uh, flexibility. So overall, the effect is that it, it tends to energize. You can energize yourself doing these uh, these poses that she's been working on. There are 12 of them. And in this particular video, she is talking about a pigeon pose. And what she's done here is, uh, this is something that came out of her last video where she had done a talk video and then a demo video. But that happened because, uh, because of the software that she was using. But then I said, you know, it might be better to do it that way. So here you'll see, in this video, if you watch them, you'll see that Julie is very confident. She's got her act together. She's, uh, uh, she doesn't have to worry about uh, worrying about whether she's going to be able to finish it or not. She knows that this is going to be a talk video, and this is going to be a demo video. So she's not trying to mix up the two. And I think it kind of shows uh, in the video the way she has approached it uh, in, in doing the video. And I think that's a very good uh, lesson that if you're watching this, can learn. Focus your video on one thing. You can always connect, you know, stitch them to technology. Is not, technology should not be the hindrance. You can always con you know, stitch things together, but focus on the main message that you want to convey. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Julie to discuss the two videos. And then uh, if she has any kind of feedback that she wants from me, I'll be happy to give it to her. So Julie, why don't you take over and explain these, uh, the video that you did? Thank you, Jay. Yes, yeah, so um, to um, respond to your feedback, I agree with you that it was a happy serendipity that um, I'm doing two videos now because it really does give me more time to focus and to be clear. Um, in talking about the pigeon, the pigeon itself is a, I'll talk about what I talked about and I'll talk about the movement. And um, I'm happy to take all feedbacks. I did find a camera my son has, so I'm going to try to use a different camera for the next one. Um, so from a, from an anatomy and function, a physiology point of view, the pigeon is about opening up our hips. So if you think of um, our body as a sideways H, so you have the shoulder, and the hips, and then there's the spine that connects it, okay? The hips is the baseline, it's the bottom. And because human beings move, the hips are very important in providing strength and stability when we stand, and also dynamic movement. So the hips is the source of power to use the gravity forces, and so it's, um, to look at the um, the reverse H is a really good thing to do because the one of the things that I always talk about is the forces of gravity coming down. But if you can in alignment, it actually supports you up. The second thing is the psoas muscle. The psoas muscle connects all the way to the middle of the spine through the pelvis into the inner thigh. So it is um. It is that uh, the hip, the hip is the low hinge that moves everything and has the most mass in our body. Okay, so most of us, when we're young, our pelvis is too weak. So then our work we compensate using our pelvis and we lose alignment, and this carry us all the way into old age. And then in old age, we lose alignment continuously through the years. And also, we lose flexibility because um, our fear of movement limits our range. Our limiting of the range uh, deprives us of the range of motion. So opening the hips up really is very important to be powerful, to live your life with action. So one of the things I do is if I'm doing a vision work, um, or if I'm going into a big project, I work on my hips. Because amazingly, the fear to act is actually literally embedded in the hips. Okay, so I try to explain that and also how powerful that move is, and then I demonstrated it, which uh, I don't need to go through it. Um, I think the demonstration was very good, and just as a final point, I like to say thank you. Without you know this whole idea of serendipity discovering things that we don't know about. Uh, I, 
I'm writing a book on these poses, but as you know, I didn't know how to move forward. And I believe by doing these features and having your feedback, I'm actually beginning to find uh, organization and clarity. So I just want to acknowledge that uh, sometimes um, we don't know what benefits comes from our practice, right? So thank you, and I'm, I'm eager to hear your feedback. <clears throat> yeah, Julie, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, I think uh, what you just said is, uh, is quite uh, interesting, that whenever you're stuck, the best thing to do is just keep doing it, because uh, that in itself, uh, by doing it, you will, because uh, when you're doing it, uh, you somehow, there's an energy that gets created, because that makes the other people notice it, and they provide some feedback, and you have to make sure that the people that are providing feedback really are the right type of people. But just by doing it alone, you will probably uh, figure it out. Uh, and uh, that usually, rather than looking for somebody to inspire you, uh, it's it doesn't work like that. And I think my whole point was to just say, look, if you're stuck, that's OK. Everybody gets stuck. But don't get stuck in, 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 in keep doing things, because then you will organize it and everything you're doing, either you can use it or you don't have to use it, but at least you've done it. That in itself, it becomes a small win. And I think that's what uh, you're noticing, that by doing it, it, it's helping you to gather your ideas better, saying, okay, yes, I see, Here's this is now working, this is now working, oh, I get it now. But if you just leave it off, then you can't come back to it. So I think uh, I, I, I agree with what you just said. Uh, I like I like the way you did this. The talk, uh, you're confident. You go right up front, and I'm noticing it because I don't know whether not worrying about the demo allowed you to just say, "Okay, I'm just going to focus on the talk." But it showed that you were really relaxed, and I like the way you gave that uh, the boxing example, which is the whole point of it. The talk was to get people really interested in the pose and showing how much power, if you use your entire body, the way you just using that punch motion, that it's not just punch, it's the entire body that you're putting into it. That's what gives you the power, uh, whether it's boxing or any of the uh, martial art moves, that it's the entire body. That's why you see sometimes these people that are not big, but they have such tremendous power because they're using every ounce of their the body into the, and they can actually break uh, blocks and stuff because of that they know how to do it I like the way you uh, you ended it the way you summarized it you know say strong this pigeon pose will uh, help helps you with st st strength stability and flexibility and then I like the way when you went into the demo you started out with that which is good because I think the way you end the talk is where you want to begin begin the demo that uh, uh, and uh, and at that point, the one thing I would suggest, and these are not like these are minor things, urge them to see the the talk. That you know, in case you haven't seen the talk, we concluded the last the, the talk part about it, that the, the the pigeon pose allows you become strong, gives you stability, and gives you flexibility. And I urge you to watch it because I, I go into that in more detail since you're not going to do that in the demo. But at least let them know that that's there. Reference that. And I, I don't know whether you did or not, but I just noted it down. So maybe I didn't hear it. And then um, uh, at, oh, OK, so because in the demo, basically what you're showing, you're telling them is that, that this one, I'm going to actually show you the pose that we discussed in the talk like that. There's got to be that the transition is what I'm talking about. Uh, and another thing I think I, I, I think when you demo it, I think you talked about the three stages. And in the demo, you got to make sure that the demo is very consistent with what you're saying. Uh, when you were going through it, uh, again, it should be referencing the talk like, OK, this is the stage one that we talked about. Boom. And I think the, I think that the, the pigeon pose was done in three stages. That's what you said in the talk. But when you are demoing it, I don't know whether you specifically used it. It's like, okay, this is stage one. This is now stage two I'm moving into. And now I'm moving into stage three, like that. 
So I, I might have missed it, but I don't remember the word stage coming up in the demo which did, that you did use in the, in the talk. So uh, you want to make sure that the talk and the demo are consistent. And, and oh, the last thing is uh, I just thought that the demo uh, uh, was, was really well done. The only thing I would point out is it, again, ended kind of abruptly. You want to relax a little bit before you actually end it. You just, uh, you just, I think, kind of ended it like pigeon is for power, and then you just said, and I'm Julie Wu Finkelstein. Uh, just take a deep breath. You don't need to end it abruptly. Just say, again, let me just reiterate the three things again. And it's OK, like you said, you can repeat these things multiple times. That pigeon is, uh, provides you strength, provides you stability, provides you flexibility. And then th there should be a call to action. Now that you've learned it, I hope you can do it. You know, you can do it yourself. And then you can say, and if you have any questions, you know, watch this again, or just give me, or, or get in touch with me, or something like that. So there is a definitely a call to action. Those are like minor points, which I think you're pretty close to getting. But besides that, I think you got the framework. You just need to kind of tie these things well together, so there is some cohesion there. And then the ending, just take, just relax a little bit, and just summarize what the whole purpose of this pose was. The three things that you had mentioned. And then also urge them to do it. And then if they have any questions, they can they can uh, contact you. And I think that would do it. So overall, I think uh, this was a this was a really well done. And any other any other questions? No, that's great. And I'll just say this was my fifth hack <laughs> on the demo. Um, yeah. And because Clip Chan has a five minute um, dead stop. You know, there's no room to give at all. I just gave up on trying to include that. That's what happened. Um, right. And I know so, you were struggling with the, the camera and the demo, but then you finally right. got it right. Then you finally got it right at the end where it was showing you exactly what you were doing. I don't right. think there's much you can do about it unless you can get somebody to hold you know, it move, the, move the camera. So I know it's kind of tough to, like I said, one thing you can do is do stage one and then stop it. Position the camera. Do stage two. Then then you can. Right. In the video editor, but that's a lot of work. Yeah, I I would do, do that, that except I ran out of time, as you know. Right, so. right, right, right. No, I think I I noticed right. it that uh, you had worked hard on this because this was your. You said the fifth one because I saw three of them. I this was the I third have. One. I, I I didn't include the other two. Oh, okay, but I, okay. I did the talk hack four times and did the demo hack five times. So uh, uh, right, because I did see the improvement from the first to the second to the third. So I did see the improvement, and oh, I good. think, and I think, I think you should be proud of doing that, and actually also including it to for me to see, because it shows to me that you are actually putting in the time. That you are actually saying, listen, I think I can do better than this. I think I can. But again, you don't want it to be perfect. You want it to be good enough. And I like it that at some point you just said, okay, <laughs> that's why these programs are good because you have to finish it by Tuesday. <laughs> you can't otherwise, <laughs> you'll never finish it. Otherwise, this could go on for another week and week and week, and then you'll just give up. So I like that imposed deadline there that you have to get it done by Tuesday no matter what. The show has to go on. So at, at some point, uh, the, the last one is always going to be good enough. And that's what we're looking for here. We're not, trying to, we're not looking for perfection. So again, congratulations. And I think, uh, I think you're getting the hang of it. You, you should really be feeling good about that the way you've done this, uh, that you can take it to the next level. And I like the amount of, look, the only thing that you can say that you're doing, that you control, is the effort that you're putting into this. And you're, you're asking for feedback. So you're doing everything right to get better, and that's the hallmark of a good student. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think Thank at you. this point uh, we'll close it out. So if you're watching this, uh, this is what you should be doing. Uh, this is something where you record a video and find a, a, a learning buddy uh, who's also interested like you are and who's willing to give the feedback and that's what we're trying to show here, uh, Julie and I. When I do a video, she gives me the feedback. When she does a video, I give her a feedback. And then you know, she can take some of the points that I'm making and then incorporate it into her. And that's how you, you get better. Let me tell you, most people who give speeches never do this. I don't see anybody out there doing this. 
this is work, and that's why people don't do it. So uh, thanks a lot, and we'll uh, uh, take a pause and move to our third segment. OK, welcome back uh, to Speech Talk Live, uh, episode 46. My name is uh, Jay Oza. Uh, I'm the host of the show, and the, my co-host is Julie Wu Finkelstein. And in this segment, uh, we're going to talk about uh, something that we all have to deal with is uh, high stakes speaking. Now, high stakes is what's in our brain, right? We are the ones who determine whether something is high stakes. And it is important to know ahead of time whether something is high stakes, not at the event, ahead of time. Because if it's not high stakes, then what that means is you're not going to either take it seriously, and that means you're not going to put in the effort. You're just going to wing it. That's not going to lead to good results. <laughs> Once in a while, you may get lucky. Uh, and sometimes you do get lucky, because what happens is if you don't consider something as high stakes, you're going to be yourself. And sometimes that's what the other person sees in you. You come across more natural. But you don't want to do that. What you want to do is, that's by accident. You don't want it to lower the stakes by accident. You want to do it purposefully lower the stakes. So the way I think, the way I handle high stakes situations, one thing that, that I recommend to you is that let's say you're going for a job interview. So let's, let's take that as an example since that's something we've all gone through and we're quite familiar with. You want the job. Let's say you want to, you're, inter you're being interviewed at Google. Everybody wants to work at Google or Facebook or uh, Apple or one of these places. And what you do is that you want the job. So you treat it as a high stakes. You're going to go and prepare real hard, like two weeks, whatever it takes. You're going to go through all the possible questions they'll ask, everything. And you're ready. Now you have an interview. Once you're ready, once you've done all the preparation, now you want to be yourself because you've already done as much as you can. You're not going to be able to come up and think on top of your feet. That's something I don't agree with, OK? You now have done all the preparation. Now it's game time. At game time, you're going to do things pretty much by instinct. If you have prepared for an answer, you're going to be giving that great answer. And the better the preparation, the better you're going to come across. But you want to be yourself at this point. Now you're not going to appear stiff and you got to say to yourself listen i've done all the preparation now even if it doesn't work out i know i can feel good that i've done everything i can and i'm going to be myself and that's what the the interviewer are going to see in fact uh, i was just uh, reading uh, this book by amy cuddy presence and in that book she talks about uh, one of her, a Harvard student had done some research on what the venture capitalists, uh, when they're listening to pitches, which ones do they usually fund? And she found, according to this uh, student's research, uh, I forgot her name, Lakshmi Balachandra, I think, was the student. Uh, she's actually now a professor at one of the colleges, uh, I think Babson or someplace. So when she was like a, a, a PhD student or a postdoc student, or fellow, whatever it was. She did the research, and what she found was that the three things that she found that kept on, uh, she kept on seeing, there was a pattern there. And what she found was that the number one thing that, that, uh, that the, she saw in the pitches that got funded was confidence. You had to be confident. Not fake confidence, genuine confidence. Second one was the comfort level. You had to look like you were comfortable. And the third one, you had to be passionate. And she said the content and your credential didn't really have that much to do with it. If you had these three, confidence, comfort level, and passion, then it likely got funded. But if you just came and said, I have uh, I've started five companies, and my content is so-and-so, the VCs didn't care about that. So people do see how you project yourself, how you repre present yourself. And that applies to, because let's face it, when you're trying to get funding, that is an interview. So it's, it seems like what has ha what she probably saw, and I don't know, I haven't seen her, her paper. I think she's currently writing a book. 
I think what that showed to me was that a lot of these people have already had done the preparation before they went to the VC. And when they were in front of the VC, this was they were just being themselves. They weren't trying to become be fake or anything like, oh, you know, I'm going to make millions of dollars or come up with some sort of a, uh, overplay the card. They were just trying to be themselves, even though they were a little bit nervous, but that was okay. But those three things really made the difference. So we're all going to be involved in high stakes speaking and you want to be in the high stakes speaking, but that high stakes should only be when you're practicing. Once you've done all the practicing and when you're actually in, uh, directly uh, in, in the moment, you should really be yourself and saying at this point, I'm just going to be myself. It works out great. Because in the post game, you can evaluate yourself and saying, OK, were you actually stiff? Why were you stiff? Was it the lack of preparation? Or somehow you just stopped being yourself? And if you stopped being yourself, why was that? Like, why did that? Uh, you can be a little bit nervous. And that's all. It's the other thing I think I pointed out in the video is the start and the ending is very important. So it's very important to make sure that you have a start because once you get that start then you'll take over and then the, you got to know how to end it so like i was saying the ask and all that that could be part of your ending so make sure you got the start right and the ending uh rehearsed so that too you don't you you can plan those two ahead and be even scripted and i think one of the example i gave was what i saw yesterday with this uh, kelly ripper uh she had some kind of a spat and she came back and she had some cute line you know the nightmare is over or something like that. And I thought that was scripted and was well done. So anyway, Julie, what are your thoughts on this uh, high stakes? How do you deal with high stakes? And what do you recommend other students do when they, when they are in a high stakes situation, like an interview, a meeting, or even a speech? Uh, well, Jay, uh, how I, uh, I will, I'll talk about how I deal with high stakes speeches. And then uh, I'd also like to give some comments on your speech. Um, so. For me, a high stakes speech, uh, I think even just coming on to uh, this show is high stakes for me because I care so much about how I appear. Um, I am not very much in the job interview these days. However, I do coach with people who are doing job interviews. and. Um, and this man who's going to go on TV and a woman who's going to be speaking with a bunch of people uh, in a very well uh, global nonprofit environment. She has a high school degree and her colleagues will be all double PhDs, mostly double PhDs. So these are all high stakes speeches and I support them. So maybe it's second hand experience. I think uh, the first thing as I mentioned in our 90 second speech is practice. I, I'm making them practice. The second thing is a clarity of identity that they really need to be confident not just about what they're doing but who they are because that is uh, the core. What they do can change in life but who they are is something I believe that they just create. So um, there's a classic book by Berger and Lockman is called Social Construction of Reality. And I believe that even the identity, there's a certain degree of creation. Uh, and that's, I think I agree with you that you want people to be authentic. So I would say practice, be confident, be clear about who you are, and then everything else for you, uh, will come across. The second thing, um, based on today's talk, I'm going to be very uh, encouraging them to do is be clear of the outcome. Be clear of the outcome, um, which is what you talk about in your speech as well. And I think the third one may sound a little bit contradictory or paradoxical, but in job interviews, certainly true. But even in public situations, is be receptive and create a connection which is what you did when you used the pen handler's uh, example. So those are my key things, is be clear about who you are, be confident about who you are and what you do, and then uh, listen or somehow be receptive and create a connection, and then be clear about the outcome. 
that's about five things. Um, in terms of your speech, I, I want to again thank, um, thank you for it because every time you talk about something, it's really important. And I agree, some of the hints I got from you was uh, do practice, don't minimize, work out scenarios, that's three, focus on the beginning, memorize it, focus on the end, memorize it. And I thought those were really good points and I like your game metaphor. Uh, the only thing I will ask for a little bit more is in your definition of what a high state speech is. It seems like that's like if if I look at your title, handling is one major theme, high state speaking is another. So um, I would like a little bit more importance focus on what is a high stake speech. I think I got from you that maybe it's a opportunity, maybe it's an emotional importance, maybe it's an outcome, and uh, to investigate that in the scenario. I really like what you said that um, during the practice period, using the game metaphor, you want to play out all the scenarios. The one thing I will add is when you talk about during the game, you said be yourself, but then today's speech you added confidence, comfort level, and passionate. And I didn't hear that in your initial speech, and I would just add that to it. Um, and I would say be opportunistically positive. Those three key terms for me comes to be Opportuni opportunistically positive. It's just a look at things. Now that you've seen all the scenarios, put your energy on the desired outcome. And then that's what you ask for at the end. That, that's, uh, I, I'm not quite sure how to word that, but I hope you got the idea. So with that, I turn over back to you. Yeah, th th thanks, Julie, for the for the feedback. Yeah, that uh, those three things about uh, confidence, I just kind of came up with it on the fly, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I don't want it to be the regurgitate exactly what I said in the video. So the video is just used as a way to have a discussion, and then I'm trying to see what more I can add to it that's not in the video. Otherwise, somebody said, hey, he just basically repeated everything that was in the video. So uh, sometimes that's what happens, that you know, when you're having a discussion, you'll come up with some more ideas. And then the video kind of stands on its own. Uh, I have a question for you. You said, uh, uh, let's see, be receptive and create a connection. What, like, like, how, how, like you, is that you're talking about like by telling a story, a personal story, or, or how, how do you do that? Um. For me, for the job interview situation, it's very clear. I am. Uh, I will ask a question, uh, but perhaps you can do that with a mass audience too. You know, a lot of times I can. I see uh, excellent speakers say, "How many of you believe in this? How many of you believe in that?" And what it does is it creates a stream or a spectrum of positions on the same major topic that they're talking about. So it differentiates and unifies and gives the speaker information simultaneously. So to and you interact with the audience. So it gives uh, in a very few moments. It does a lot to create the dynamism and a feedback loop into the speaker's uh, minds, so that the spe speaker has knows where the audience is at and is able to create a connection. Right. Right. No, that's good. Uh, the one thing I would add to that I didn't really talk about, but now that you just, uh, and again, I don't want to diverge off because we still have uh, five more minutes, is, uh, you know, when I said about uh, something that you wanted me to elaborate further, like the confidence, comfort level, and passion, I think there is a fourth in there that I think also is very important. You, you have to kind of show uh, that you're under control. And I sometimes think, and I don't know if that's included in confidence or not, but control is very important in anything you do. You have to show that, you, you, I don't want to use the word command and control, it sounds too you know, militaristic, but I think it's very important, like when I talk to somebody, 
you want to be vulnerable, but at the same time, I do want to see somebody who has control of and in command of the situation and in control of what that person. I think it goes with what you're saying, like identity. As long as you know who you are, you're under control. You don't want to be, you kind of want to stay between, again, using this football metaphor, between the 40 yard lines. You know, you don't want to kind of veer off to the one end zone to the other end zone. And that requires, uh, like you were saying, practice because you need to know that when you're given an opportunity, I think it's something you mentioned to me that uh, when I'm talking, I tend to wear off on topics, tangent topics too much. That's actually a good feedback for me because what that tells me is that I'm going away from the, the 40 yard zone. I'm drifting too much to the left or too much to the right. And that's not always, that's not a good thing actually. And, and, and I think any kind of speech you're giving, whether it's uh, this type of, this type of show kind of helps us practice that that you want to stay, you got to identify your zones. What is the 40 yard to the left and 40 yard to the right? And don't go past that, at least for this speech, because then the audience start thinking that this guy is like all over the map here. You know, where exactly is he trying to stay? They might tolerate if you're drifting a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right, but they don't want you to be completely off the outside those 40 yard boundaries. So I, I think that's something I didn't include, but uh, something that when you're in a high stake situation, you don't want to start throwing Hail Marys at them in a high stake situation. Like, hey, by the way, let me forget, let me bring up something that I wanted to talk about. That may not be the right place to do it. You know, you just want to show that. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, about this whole idea of being under you know, command and control of what you're saying? Yeah, I, I really have to think about that. So the uh, I want to give you four synonyms that kind of focus on it. Maybe we can talk offline about it or maybe have a dialogue on that. I just want to uh, underscore that I appreciate that. I didn't mean to imply that because it didn't hear um, that I was judging in any way. So I think that what you're doing what I get is one of the things when you make a video and then you talk about it is the essence of iteration, you know, and it helps us improve our speeches. So, and many times, you know, I think we should go back and do the same topic again because of the nature of that. The four words that came up with your idea of uh, control, command, I have command, control, competency, and credibility. So I think that's what that's what you were trying to get to, and the other idea is staying at the core of things. And I, I'm beginning to practice that too. I want to apologize to you because sometimes when you ask me what I think, I give you my idea, which takes you off on a tangent. So this show the first time I'm com I'm trying to stay in the core of the topic. You know, so I, I basically say, thank you, it's a great topic, and maybe we can talk about this another time. So I'm trying to support both of us on that, too. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a, good, it's a good way to, uh, because the thing is that uh, when you're in a high stakes, because we're talking about high stakes, right? When you're in a high stakes means that the time, you, you, there's a time constraint. Like like in a football game, you only have limited amount of time. You 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 just don't have time to take the entire team and saying, guys, we're gonna continue the second half after another after another week after we do some more practice. It doesn't work like that. You know, you got to do it right then and there. So whatever you have done, you're not going to be completely throw away the playbook and saying, guys, <laughs> the playbook is gone. We're gonna forget everything we did for the last week to get ready for this uh, game. Now you're on your own. Just figure it out and just uh, do it. it uh, that's kind of what I'm saying. Maybe using that uh, the sports analogy is that that you gotta have a playbook and and stick to it. Stick to the game plan because once you start diverting too much off the game plan, then you're it's gonna be you're gonna be winging it at that point, and that's just not where you want to be. That's what I was saying that. 
that like sometimes people say like when they go for a debate like these presidential candidates or even a sport that you know we we stayed with our game plan we stayed with our game plan and that's what allowed us to win because the coach told us to stay with the game plan and i think the same idea applies to a speech any high stakes situation whether it's a a job interview or if a meeting you go into uh, it's to able to execute something in a limited amount of time without going too uh, outside the game plan. And the game plan should include where you are maintaining that, that control. And I think that's something we could talk about that more on how to do that. But it, I think we kind of do it in this show because, like I said, we record the video. That kind of gives us the base. And then we kind of move a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. But we just don't completely throw away the, the 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 main idea of the video that we recorded and talk about it and go completely off the tangent and i think we kind of practice that uh in this show so and, and any closing thoughts julie before we close out uh this this program great idea thank you yeah okay so at this point uh, uh so any comment on the show anything that stood out or anything that can turn into that we need to expand uh, in the future any aspect of it uh, I think we've covered ask and I think you're going to continue to record more videos and I think you've given me some ideas on the second topic which I think the third topic is going to keep the third segment it's going to keep coming up is high stakes because that's what that's what people want they want how do you deal with it this is like books and books are written on it and we're trying to cover that in this one segment so we're going to come back to this and again, something that Julie said, which I didn't get to jot down, command, control, competency, and I think the other one was core. So I'll have to uh, view it and, and think more about it, and maybe we can do a, a segment on that discussion topic, especially on this command and control part, because I think that's important. So uh, Julie, any, any closing thoughts on the program? OK, great. So at this point, uh, let me thank you all for uh, watching, uh, watching this show. And, uh, you know, I'm currently writing a book uh, that I've tentatively titled, You Are How You Speak. And I really believe that, you know, you are how you speak. And uh, Julie and I both take this very seriously. We practice, you know, pretty much all the time, all these speeches. And it's something that, as you can see, we control that, right? We, we actually control how we come across. And this is one of the skills where it's an iterative process where you have to do it, then you have to evaluate, and you need to get some good feedback. Otherwise, uh, it's like one of those things. Speaking is one of those things when if you don't speak well, you don't know what opportunities you're missing because you'll never know it. So you want to be doing it yourself and see yourself how you are coming across. And I think it's a skill that you've got to constantly work on. It's not like a one-and-done thing. Uh, but the good news is that, uh, look, we got the technology, we have the instruction, and hey, you have this show. So I hope this uh, uh, inspires you in some ways to do it. And at the end, it's, you know, the, there are three words. Uh, there's aspiration, there is inspiration, but the most important is perspiration. <laughs> You've got to put in the time. And I uh, hope you do it, and we'll see you uh, in the next uh, show, Speech Talk Live. Uh, episode 47 so again thank you and that's the wrap all right okay um, we take a break one minute okay go ahead Okay, so um, you said you have 10 minutes, right? Yeah, right, right, right. Okay, so the book. So you want to talk yeah. about the book? Yeah, you, um, let me hold one second. I think you have a date for May. Yeah, 
Yeah, you're going to uh, have a title by May 1st. I already have the title. Oh, oh you I did? Mean, I mean, I, I'm, go I'm going to go with this. Uh, actually, I'm currently <clears throat> uh, trying to finish up my th a third draft. What I'm doing right now is I already have the draft. What I'm doing is I'm going through this uh, Grammarly, get rid of as many grammar errors as possible before uh, getting the third draft uh, in a PDF format. Okay, Jay, I don't want to hear uh, in between. I'm going to add uh, like a project manager. When the title is not the title until you say that's set in stone. Okay. That's a title so, for third draft. Let's put it that way. Okay, title for the draft. What you said. Oh, okay. Let me bring it up. It's uh, you are how you speak. Okay. And then there was a sub uh, a subtitle. Or like you said, it's part of the title, but uh, it's right. the description part two. afterwards. It's like uh, you said something like step-by-step -step guide to something okay. like that. Okay, it's not done unless it's done, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I have it. I, I can give it to you. Let me just make sure I get it right. Okay, I, you I, want I, to email it to me then? I, I, just, I, can, I can give I, it to you right now. Okay, I just want to be a hard ass. That's okay. That's your job. Right. <laughs> okay, I, I, it's, it's you are, have you speak. Self-guided training to speak with anyone, anytime, anywhere, any occasion. Too long. Okay, so. Self-guided training. For I think I think I changed it. You had something else. Self-guided training to speak. Uh, speak for all occasions, something like that. That's what I think. What you had, you had given me. Okay, but you like for any time. I just changed it to you for like now. It better? Okay, anywhere, anytime. You don't need any occasion because anywhere, anytime is any occasion. Okay, so get rid that's of my that. opinion. Okay. All right. that's, that's, uh, that I can remember. I'm trying to use my brain. If okay. I can remember, then that's. Okay, so we got anyone, anytime, anywhere. Okay. Yeah, yeah anywhere, anytime. Self guided training for anywhere, anytime. You want any occasion? I mean, we can add it. I'll I'll put it in there right now, and then yeah, we can always okay. take it out. This is again okay. a draft, so. Right. Okay, so that's done. Great. So the idea is five. Uh, five fifteen. You will have a PDF. I'll I'll have a PDF. I'll have a PDF actually before that. You will you will send it to an editor though that also includes oh editor editor. oh editor editor I I okay so one of the thing I was thinking of was this uh, because see here's what I'm struggling with right now okay what this book really needs is and I just wanted to get your take on it I'm thinking of making this third draft I don't know what you think it's a good idea or a bad idea uh, available to people who are seriously interested in becoming a good speaker. And I need like a, because I was thinking, I, I need a content review done of this book. Content, not, and content can only be done by people who have interest in this topic, not somebody who has no interest. So how do I do that? That's the, see, so far the only person who has really read this uh, is you. But I need other people besides you right. to read it. Because I don't have to fresh eye anymore. Well, content. you could. You could look could I, could, should, can I just can I like make it uh, like a, a available to Coursera student? Do you think that's a good idea or not? Yeah, you can, and you may. Or, the problem is you have no control. You may or may not get the content, the quality of the content feedback you need. Yeah, so, well, that's a chance I can I have to take because otherwise I at least that way I know that people who are registered for that course are interested in public speaking, and I can. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to send it to Fabiana to just look at the, I have to point out specific things to look at because otherwise the book is going to be too big to look at it from entirety. Okay. So I can just say, Hey, listen, can you just take a look at the 330 challenge and see if this helps? And that's it. So that way it's narrows the scope considerably for the person. I think I'm just, we're just uh, brainstorming here and just yeah. and be honest. And we got five minutes. Yeah. Okay, so I think you really need someone to read the whole book, but not word for word, because what you want to get, you want them to skim it. You need someone to skim the whole book so that they can have some idea whether the message is consistent okay. and clear right. across all the whole book. And where do you find that person? 
You might have to hire somebody. Maybe you can hire Fabiana. Maybe you can hire Fabiana for a hundred bucks or something. Yeah, uh, Fabiana is not the right person to hire because uh, I would need to hire somebody that I don't know. Okay, then I would hire some. Maybe you can find somebody from India. Yeah, yeah, that's what uh, I'm thinking of doing, and just pay them. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of really good writers from India, so I, yeah. I don't need them to write anything. I just need them to look at the content only. Right, I, I just, mean, I, you know what I mean. There are a lot of people who can do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. I think you're right. That's what I'm going to do. So I think you I, need to uh, maybe pay a couple hundred dollars the most, which is not that much. Yeah. The other thing I want you to do is to find a cop stuff already. Find a copy editor that you like. Start asking mm -hmm. for a copy editor, and also find out your ISB. Get a total budget for your book. Start working the numbers, and give me a final timeline. Yeah, that's all going to start uh, 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 starting from uh, maybe my Monday, or maybe this weekend. First, yeah, identify I what I don't need. I don't need a next week. But I yes. need you to start the task. Task. Right, right. Because right, right. one thing I learned about the stuff you are telling me to read about procrastination is once you kick off the task in your brain, your unconscious starts working on it. Yeah. You don't even have to work on it actively. But I want those three questions to be uh, in your mind. So I don't, I don't want you to say, oh, I'm, I'm not going to work on it until I get this done. Just say, oh. Uh, I'm just going to let it rest until the answer comes to me. Meanwhile, I'm doing this. It's just a reframing. Right, right. So so, so here, here's what I will send to you by the, this weekend. Because like I said, I didn't think this was going to take longer. I was hoping to get it done by last weekend. But then when I put into Grammarly, I'm finding a lot of uh, errors. So I have to correct them. I'm yeah. hoping to. So right now, it's about two thirds done. There's only one third left now. OK. And that should be done by. See, I can't do today. I don't know how much time I'll be able to get because I have to take. I have to go right now to take my mom to the dentist. But uh, later in the evening, I should be able to make good progress. And by tomorrow, at the latest, I should be done. Okay, so tomorrow. Today's the twenty seventh. That's like May first. Oh no! Uh, let's put it Friday. By Friday, okay. I, I, my days are getting mixed up. I don't know what Friday is. That would be twenty ninth. Okay, let's just say May first. Oh, okay, will, right, right. May right. first, I will get a copy from you. Yeah, and if not, just put a reminder. Hey, yeah, where's my copy? Yeah, and I, I will read it again. You can do the media <laughs> <alert>. <laughs> um, and I, I'll tell you this. I don't care if it's Grammarly checked or not. By May first, I want a copy. Yeah, you better have it on your email. Otherwise, yeah, I better have my copy. Otherwise, you're gonna be at my front door. Where is my copy? No, otherwise I'm going to send you something. Oh no! <laughs> like a, I don't want like, to a, like a stink bomb. <laughs> <laughs> okay, May first. May first, I want a copy. I don't care if it's checked by okay. Grammarly because I'm not that sensitive about that, anyways. But I'm going to read it again for you. And then also. Oh, and another thing I did was I did put the, the forward. I was supposed to send you the questions. So right now, I've taken the liberty of pretending I'm Julie Wu Finkelstein. <laughs> so I have to. <laughs> That's fine. So, That's so fine. I, have, I put in all these things about your journey from Hong Kong and all that. <laughs> Who knows if that is true or not? Okay. Just send me what you got, and I'll yeah. start thick around with it. Okay? Based on some of the things you've talked about, that I said you know that you learned a lot about speaking from work, and I, some of it I just made it up. It's fiction, yeah. but just know, send maybe, it to me. Okay. Send it to me. All right, I, I will. First, all right, Julie. First. Thanks okay. a lot. I have to. I have, have to run. Sorry to, sorry to cut this short, Perfect. but uh, my like dad's like my dad's waiting there. Okay. I like it like that. Okay. All take right. care. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot for your help, Julie, as always. Okay. Bye. Bye.